Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first Montefiore Graduate Student Seminar uh, held here or there, I should say, because we are in virtual space uh, these, uh, these days and these months at the Azrael Institute of Israel Studies. My name is uh, Chaba Nicolini. I'm the director of the Institute, and uh, it's my pleasure and great fortune to bring this very important event to you with the able assistance and help. Uh, of my assistant, uh, Jennifer Solomon. So um, Jennifer, thank you again for uh, doing all the magic that you've been doing to make this very important presentation and seminar uh, organized and, uh, and uh, brought to, uh, to our community. Uh, the Montefiore Graduate Seminar is a very important event in the life cycle of the Institute because it gives us an opportunity to celebrate the graduate student winners uh, of the Montefiore Graduate Award that every year we give out to, uh, to the best students uh, in a very competitive pool of applications. And last year, had it not been for Corona, we would, or we would already have had, in fact, we had plans and we circulated the save the date flyers in the community uh, and on campus because we were so anxiously waiting uh, to organize this panel to bring together Tal Orben Horin and Natasha Doyon the two winners uh, of the uh, Montefiore Graduate Awards from the pre previous academic year. Unfortunately, COVID-19 interfered with our plans, but, um, but even COVID-19 can be overcome with the goodwill and the dedication uh, of our students uh, and, and our community. So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, Talor Ben Khorin and Natasha Doyon uh, to this graduate student uh, seminar and invite them to present their research uh, on the basis of which and which they, uh, which they were able to complete with the support that the award provided. So um, please give me a couple of minutes to share briefly um, the biographies of these students. Uh, I, will start, I will start and proceed in the order in which uh, the two uh, winners were listed on the flyer, starting with Tal Or and then moving to Natasha. After that, uh, each of the students, each of the presenters will have 20 minutes uh, to present their work. And then we will have um, just about 20 minutes uh, also for Q&A for uh, question and answer uh, at the end. We will have to wrap up uh, at one o'clock uh, Montreal time or Eastern Standard Time. So um, Jennifer and I will have to be vigilant and make sure that, uh, uh, that, um, all, that all the answers will be given within to, to the questions within the time frame that we have. So let me start with a brief introduction of Talor first. Talor is an artist and a doctoral candidate at Concordia University in the Department of Art History, specializing in the study of photography. Her doctoral studies that were supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and Fulbright focus on the institutionalization of photography education in Canadian and American schools between 1960 in 1989. Talor's work, scholarly work, has been published in a variety of outlets such as After Image Online, Canadian Jewish Studies, and the Contemporary Review of the Middle East. Today, Talor is going to present to us her important work under the title In Search of Israeli Photography. After Talor, we'll hear from Natasha, who has over 20 years of experience as an artist and an art educator. Natasha taught at universities, public schools, worked in community building initiatives, and developed art education curricula and programs for the elderly and abused women. Natasha has a BFA, an MFA, a B.Ed., and has just completed the second year of her PhD in the art education department at Concordia. As I, uh, we have just discussed it uh, in preparation for this seminar, uh, Natasha is now currently busy preparing for her com comprehensive examination. Uh, Natasha is an Israeli-Canadian, uh, and uh, she is uh, very proud of this. And as such, her research is at the intersection of social justice and art education, more specifically on how to create critical pedagogical spaces for youth, using the arts as a catalyst for equitable cultural representation in an area of intractable conflict. In this spirit, Natasha today is going to present to us her work under the title Coexistence Through Art, with Israeli and Palestinian youth. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, I first give you Tal Or Ben Khorin. Tal Or, over to you. 
I'm unmuting myself. I'm just doing the whole technology thing. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank Chaba and Jennifer for organizing this, as well as the um, funders of the Montefiore Graduate Student Award. It means so much to have um, the opportunity to share my research and um, have support for my ongoing investigations. So I'm going to just jump right into my paper because um, we're short on time. So. On August 19th, 1839, French astronomer, physicist, mathematician, and politician Francois Dominique Ergo announced Louis Daguerre's invitation, invention of photography to the French Academy of Science, marking the first patent provided to a photographic process. The daguerreotype, of which you see an example of now, produced a singular photographic object. By November of that same year, Horace Vernet and his nephew Frederick Gopili Fresquet had arrived in Palestine to capture images of the Holy Land on behalf of Noël Marie Palma Le Bols. As the prototype process was not reproducible, such objects were used as references for engravers who illustrated the depicted data. Only altering real ambitions for the Ving audience, an example of which can be seen in this slide. Other photographers, which soon follow suit, traveling across the Near East to capture various sites. Such surveys were largely motivated by three objectives to obtain evidence or document archaeological sites, to affirm religious beliefs, or for com commercial gains through the sale of souvenirs. At times, the lines between such ambitions were blurred as photographs circulated and were used for multiple purposes. An example of this can be seen in the work of Félix Bonifice, a French photographer who immigrated to Beirut and opened a studio there. His produced portfolio of photographs could be purchased as individual prints or at times rearranged as albums. Those who purchased single photographs could construct independent narratives of the region blending the works of multiple photographers, as can be seen in the example of this album from the BNF collection. As photography was embraced for its rela relationship to reality, photographs were readily accepted as evidence of the depicted material. Thus, a photograph captured by Fonafis with commercial ambitions may circulate under completely different conditions. The immigration of such data can be seen in this chart of Jewish garb. As one of the three sitters visualized in the photograph has been plucked from the image and placed into the historical illustration tracing the progression of Jewish dress. This use of the photograph disregards the photographer's motivations for posing, dressing, designing, and lighting the captured material. By placing the figure within the chart, the photograph, which may have been produced to satisfy the desires of tourists, has been accepted as a fact. It has become embedded as a part of a new historical narrative. Yet photographers at the time gave little thought to rearranging subjects and materials to illustrate the report they were seeking. I chose these brief examples to demonstrate that photography can be located in the region of modern day Israel shortly after the founding of the medium and helped shape the imaginings of local daily life. Yet such depictions are not simple to untangle. Photography's inherent Phot photographs inherently welcome a slippage of meaning as they circulate, implying that the study of a single photographic image can follow a trajectory from the studio production to historical evidence. Photographs commissioned for family albums may become records of local inhabitants, and archaeological studies can be appreciated for their pleasing compositions as artworks. With this in mind, how can a history of photography in the region be formed? Is it the intentions of the photographer capturing the image that are key or the use of the image? More, my explorations into the subject of Israeli photography began through my research into the influence of Canadian and American photographic education. There I found that social networks formed in institutions of higher education 
were key to fostering the foundation of the creative photography field. Educators required students who are willing to accept the medium as an art form, some of which in turn would take on positions as photographers, curators, gallerists, educations, historians, and critics propelling the medium forward. The hope of the early photography educators was that those who did not participate in the field professionally would at the very least view photography as an art, supporting the exhibitions and sales of the medium. These relationships were crucial as they ushered in the photo boom, a period defined by a drastic increase in support of photography throughout the 1970s. Prior to this stage, photographers with creative ambitions were unlikely to sustain themselves through photography alone. As I began my exploration of Israeli photography, I looked to historical texts to identify Israeli photographers, hoping to be able to trace their careers back to their educational roots. What I found, however, was a knotted web of transnational relationships, documented briefly only through a limited number of texts. Catalogues and short books, most notably by Guy Raz and Nissan Perez, detail the history of photography in the region, often commencing shortly after photography's funding. Such writing echoes the course of American photography history, writing which establishes the medium through technological advancements. Aside from these two curators, Ariela Azule has written extensively on Palestinian photography. In her studies, photographs are used to unpack power dynamics and desires of institutions, applying a critical approach stemming from French, French literary theorists such as Michel Foucault. Outside of these analyses, I believe the most common historical writing on photography production in modern day Israel consists of analysis of depictions of the Holy Land. Scholarship on this topic is easily available in English. Moreover, exhibitions related to this theme can be located at major museums as can be seen in the 2016 to 2017 Faith and Photography, August Salzman and the Holy Land exhibition held at the Metropolitan Museum. Curator Nissan Perez, in his catalog Timeframe, A Century of Photography in the Land of Israel, commenced his historical narrative in 1898, when a photograph was produced of Theodor Herzl meeting Kaiser Wilhelm II, a depiction that quickly became an icon in the history of Zionism. The photograph was a composite of or a photo montage, as the photographer David Wolfson did not capture the moment of the two men meeting. This photograph illustrates the importance of photography to communicating nationalistic myths, a use that would continue well into the years of Israel's formation. Images in such cases were key to forming a narrative of the country that could be shared as a rallying call. Therefore, this photograph would make a compelling starting point to illustrate the history of the medium in terms of a nation building. Surely then, such a photograph would be followed by the history of institutions such as Karen Kayamet Israel, founded in 1901, and Karen Hayesod, founded in 1920. These organizations frequently commissioned photo phot photographs as part of the Zionist propaganda effort. As such, photography in the region continued to be used as a means of constructing a nationalistic narrative. Simultaneously, studio photographers, including local residents of Armenian, Jews, Christian, Arabs, Greek Orthodox Americans, Europeans, and missionaries from various denominations continued to photograph in the region. Together, these photographers formed documents of local, inha local inhabitants, as well as affirmations of narratives of their geographic region. Some of these studio-based photographers offered services where tourists could dress in local garb to capture their portraits. Many offered their services to government officials and made portraits of the social elite. So such depictions too belong to a history of the region. While some of these photographs may have created, may have been created with creative ambitions, much of the photographic output would be considered commercial in nature. Another wave of photography production correlates to an influx of Eastern European Jews who immigrated to Palestine to avoid persecution. With them, they brought the styles of photographic movements ongoing in their native countries. Photographers such as Ruven Gross, Nahum Tim Gidal, Helmer Lersky, and Hans Pin emulated the styles of European modernists, techniques that were also honed by the Russians and Germans for state propaganda. 
The clearest date to commence a delineation of the history of Israeli photography is 1948 with the founding of the state, yet doing so would disregard the roots that many photographers had established in the region. Moreover, this point marks a significant loss of photographic data, as pictorial information that contradicted the Zionist narrative was discarded or omitted from local collecting practices. Surely local photographers and those who immigrated shortly after the founding of the State of Israel would have been privy to some form of documentation of the region. Moreover, this would have discarded the institutional history of our organizations such as Karen Kayam of the Israel and Karen Hayesod, which continue to produce photographs. The conflicts emerging in the region after the formation of the State of Israel lent themselves to the the flourishing of photojournalistic practices. Foreign and local photographers were eager to document the ongoing events. Famed Hungarian-American photojournalist Robert Kappa, for example, photographed in Israel between 1948 and 1950. Photojournalists brought images of the young country to the front pages of newspapers and into the homes of both Israeli and global citizens, shaping in many ways the reception of the country. As such, a study of photojournalism in the country would surely entail the consideration of both Israeli and foreign photographers, press organizations, as well as the po political forces at play. If the history of creative photography in Israel was to start similarly to the art historical narratives of the region, it would be aligned with the formation of Betzalel in 1906, yet a photography department in the art school was not founded until 1973. Much like American and Canadian higher education institutions, these schools were key to fostering the growth of creative photography in Israel as they offered employment to creative photographers. Yet many of the early educators in these institutions were Americans who immigrated to Israel or Israelis trained in the United States. Yosef Cohen, for example, was born in New York in 1945 and immigrated to Israel in 1971 after completing his studies in photography at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Soon after settling in Israel, he became one of the founding lecturers hired in the photography department at Betzala. As such, early creative photography programs in the country are reflective of American photography ambitions. Israeli photography programs further encourage the influence of foreign photography by inviting established photographers such as Robert Frank to provide workshops to their students and by teaching the history of the medium through American texts. As such, emerging creative photographers, gallerists, curators, and writers were at the very least aware of American creative photography trends. The clearest impact of photographic education in Israel outside the walls of the academy can be found in exhibition catalogs. Such texts shed light on the ways that photography was discussed and accessed. American influence is apparent in the documentation of the Israeli Photography Biennale of 1986, held at Mishkan Umanut at the Museum of Art in En Herod. According to Gairaz, the exhibition marked one of the first attempts in Israel to showcase a collective style that reflected photographic approaches emerging in the country. In the works on view, it was obvious that a focus was placed on personal or artistic photography rather than straight documentary or photojournalistic approaches. The Binal was organized by Gila Bao, Avraham Elad, Avi Gano, Blankalit Gatman, Yana Fischer, Micha Kirshner, and Simchash Shirman. Of these seven, only two had studied in Israel. The other had pursued their studies abroad, mainly in the United States. It is telling that while the curators for Israeli, one of the catalog essays was written by an American, Alan Colt. Notably, neither Baal, author of the exhibition's first essay, nor Colt, make reference to the works on display in the exhibition or even the photographers selected for the Biennale. Their texts instead can be read as a set of goals or ambitions motivated by such an exhibition, including the creation of an audience, documentation of local photographic production, establishment of a vocabulary with which to discuss photography, and the development of photography pedagogies inspired by and at times mirroring American teaching. Similar links can be drawn from photography collections in the country. The Israel mm -hmm. Museum's photography collection was initially formed by an American, the portrait photographer Arnold Newman. When Nissan Perez became curator in 1977, Newman continued to work closely with the department through the Friends of Photography Department program. 
Res, for his part, was critical of, in the development of and documentation of Israeli photography. He achieved this not only through collection development, but also curating exhibitions and publishing exhibition catalogs, often with a focus on Israeli photography. Perez, who held the position of curator of photography at the museum from 1977 to 2013, spent a year in an, in an internship program between 1978 and 1979 at the Eastman Museum, a major photography hub in the United States. The other major collection of creative photography in the country was founded in 1977 by Micha Baal-Am at the Tel Aviv Art Museum. Baal-Am held the position of curator and advisor to the museum for 20 years until 1997. Baal-Am immigrated to Mandate, Palestine in 1936. Soon thereafter, he began photographing kibbutzim with a borrowed camera. His pursuits of photography became solidified when he was charged with covering the Sinai War in 1956. After achieving success in Israel as a photojournalist, Baal-Am went abroad and was subsequently active in the American Photographic Network. In 1947, he was one of the founding members of the International Center of Photography in New York City. The institution was both a photography museum and a school. Baal-Am's integration into the social fabric of the American Photographic Network is testified through his inclusion in, the 19, in 1976 as the only member of Magnum, an organization established of the most important photojournalists of the era, including Robert Kappa, Henry Cartier-Bresson, and David Chaim Seymour. Baal-Am's inclusion in this organization of photographers solidified him as an active participant in the American photography scene, not as an Israeli interloper, but as a contributing and equal valued member. I trace these institutional histories as they are key to understanding the factors that might have influenced the delineation of a history of a historical narrative of Israeli photography production. These briefly illustrated examples showcase the difficulty of, des of designating individuals into a particular history. Surely Balaam's involvement in photojournalism would align him with part of the story of the progression of that tendency of photography in Israel yet he began photographing in the region prior to the country's formation. Moreover, Bar Am's involvement in Magnum, the International Center of Photography, and the Tel Aviv Art Museum demonstrate that he was partaking also in the construction of the history of creative photography. Such a relationship is reflective of the broader situation of photography as it was largely marginalized within an established art world in the 1970s and 1980s. This led to the formation of a strong network of individuals who worked together to help establish the discipline at large. These personal links existed in the social, not geographic realm. People moved fluidly across international borders, leaving traces transnationally. Yet it was American values of the medium that were solidified through photography pedagogy and in turn reflected in the marketplace. When I started this research, I was hoping to gain insight into what was unique about Israeli photography production. What I have found thus far is that the issue is muddied by the material that is available for research. Early photography curators in Israel were at the very least aware of the history of photography as established through American narratives. While not the only influence, this value system would surely have persuaded their collecting habits and as such the material available for study. Israeli photographers who trained in Israeli schools would have been coached similarly in works that were already identified as masterpieces by, Amer by largely American thinkers. These understandings would have, been, would have impacted the chances of Israeli photographers to obtain exhibitions, be collected, and ultimately support themselves financially as practicing artists. As I returned to my research for Israeli photography, I found myself more, with more questions than answers. Would it be possible to write a history of local photographic production? If so, would photographers active in the region who were not citizens of the country be reflected in such narrative? Should photography produced in response to different motivations be combined into a singular history? How should images that have become ingrained in the, in the construction of place be addressed? If national if national photography collections are indeed influenced by political, social, and economic values established by exterior markets, what figures or styles have been omitted? How can such accounts be recovered? 
How can one untangle the history of creative photography in the region from the use of photography as nationalistic propaganda? How could the intentions of photographers, their sitters, patrons, and the viewers be balanced? Finally, how would educating Israeli phot photography students in the history of their geographic habitat alter local production? Oh, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Talor. Right on time. Right on time. So thank you for keeping to the time limit. Uh, and before turning it over to Natasha um, to uh, deliver to us yet another fascinating presentation, I do want to uh, take a moment and, um, and recognize the presence of uh, two very special, very important members of our community in the audience. Of course, Dr. Lauren Lerner, who uh, was a founding member. She's waving right there in the middle of my screen, at least. Um, uh, Lauren was a founding uh, member of the advisory group of the Israel Institute of Israel Studies a decade ago and um, much to our sadness she uh, took uh, retirement from Concordia this year but as you see once a Concordia and once a member of the Institute you always are claimed by us and another very special uh, friend and colleague in the audience is Dr. Sigal Barkai who uh, was a former visiting uh, researcher at the Institute. And if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Barkai, you're joining us from Tel Aviv. Uh, is that correct? Um, yeah, so thank you for staying up so late and uh, uh, staying with the program. Thank you. So um, the floor is over to you, Natasha. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for that talk. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Um, so my name is Natasha Doyon, and I would like to say a deep thank you to the Israeli Institute of Israel Studies for supporting my research. Um, this is particularly meaningful support as I've often felt that there is little understanding or curiosity amongst my peers in my department um, with work relating to Israel. Um, so I want to highlight that this institute holds a unique and necessary presence on our university campus and thank you for that. Um, I'm a third year PhD candidate in the art department at the art education department at Concordia and my research has been halted in a significant way as I was supposed to be in Israel right now but due to COVID-19 um, I am here and I hope to be back when as soon as possible. Um, so my work is with is at the intersection of peace education, art and at the Muse, Israel Museum and Hand in Hand Schools in Israel. Um, so art, social justice are, are two things that intersect. And in Israel particularly, there's these, I'd like to do these case studies in places where they have had over 20 years of experience doing this with Arabs and Israelis, um, despite the intractable conflicts that despite the actual complications of creating these projects, they're ongoing. Um, Bell and Desai argue that the connection between art and social justice can help us imagine, create, and transform the practices that sustain oppression as it exists across history and locality. Um, so under the shadow of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the arts are used as a means. Um, how can I move this window here? as a means to develop social justice awareness. Um, the art has been used to dispel stereotypes, develop equitable cultural representation, um, which in Israel we know through the dominant cultural presence, um, the Arabs are not able to culturally represent themselves and equally that there are many minority um, that are not equally represented in Israel either. So allow for the contradictory collective narratives, histories, and memories to coexist. Art facilitates through the use of images and imagination and symbols to express feelings and to unpack the psychosocial representations that are put through by the media or by our collective narratives, narratives and histories. Um, through art, we can collab create collaboratively, build connections, and essentially sit with the other and there are not very many opportunities where we can just sit with what is considered the other in Israel. Um, the reason for my research is to fill the gap in literature regarding the history of peace education in Israel with youth and the use of arts. In addition to wanting to share this research with the international community of art educators to shed some light on what is possible in situations of intractable violence, enduring intractable violence, and the positive and possible impacts that arts can have as um, 
social as to advocate for social justice and develop awareness um, through critical art pedagogies. Um, so one thing is that it's really difficult to measure peace education because of the complexity of situations. Um, people can't agree on what peace is. Um, when there are conflicts, they interrupt any kind of progress that is being made. And there is always one group that is slightly more in power than the other. Therefore, um, peace education is difficult in itself. And when, when we add that we're working with youth, um, it, uh, more difficulties arise as we don't have, um, children are usually silenced and they are used as collateral damage. Um, I just need to go to the next screen. Okay, so I created basically these um, two kind of like, they're not great triangles, um, but basically just to show what can come out of a critical art pedagogy approach um, through an equitable cultural representation um, of our communities and how that can lead to connection between people towards an inclusive education. Um, in Israel, these schools tend to be special schools or extracurricular programs. And in the public school, although art of course is taught, you are lacking this critical pedagogical approach. And within that, you're not, we're not understanding or giving opportunity for discussions around what is being taught, how is it being taught, what is omitted, and having space for those conversations. Um, I'm talking specifically through the art program. Um, and in the art program, we can ask these questions. Um, for instance, at the Hand in Hand School that's existed since 1998 um, and 2004 officially, but began in, in 1998, they have from K to 12, a school that exists um, with, well, six schools throughout Israel, but they have bilingual education. So you have Arabs and Israelis together with Arab and Israeli teachers in these schools, and they're learning in each their respective languages, but having access to the other. And in this bilingual um, environment, connections are made and in, in, towards this inclusive coexistence um, education. And through the art room, when I had the chance to visit, um, they're in this space, they are able to ask questions. And although they are able to hold these concrete narratives, um, whereas when we live, look at a standard public school, for instance, that doesn't have this questioning or the space embedded within the school, it becomes, there's something missing. So I'm just looking at the triangle and the emptiness. So just a visual kind of representation. Um, and then again, at the museum, at the Israel Museum, what they've been doing for over 20 years, again, about 28 years, uh, 22 years after the Oslo Accords, um, they developed these programs that have with coexistence between Arabs and Israelis um, in order for them to learn together, visit the museum together, and create together. Um, when I went last year, I went to the Israel Museum and they invited me to just observe and I had um, the opportunity to just go every day um, over a month. And these groups come together twice a week for a whole year. So they're Israeli and Arab children. They create together, they visit um, exhibitions in the museum, they create work to respond to um, the exhibitions at the museum, and there's a conversation. However, what we don't see here is that there are about four or five volunteers that come to translate. Um, and the educator, uh, her name was Yael, she said, well, you know what's interesting is that um, we don't call Israeli, Arab, this and this, we call, it, we say Ivri or Aravi. So basically you're either a Hebrew speaker or an Arab speaker. Um, and this was the great divide. In essence, language, beyond the complexities of the political situation, um, the inequities that exist throughout the society, um, being just amongst Israelis or between the Arab and Israeli situation, um, is language. And so here we see that the people can't really communicate, the, the teacher speaks Hebrew, then you have all these other um, volunteers translating for the children. And what happens is, um, what has happened over the years, for the last eight years, let's say with the rising, with the right being more and more in power and more of a, device, of a divided society, um, it, about 16 is Arab children and four Israeli children. Before it used to be equal, now they're, uh, 
there's less Israelis that are interested in participating in these programs. One is the, the political climate, and also the fact that they have choices economically to either choose basketball or maybe uh, this, this program, um, which uh, obviously changes, changes, and obviously we're speaking here to, we're preaching to the converted. You will not have extreme situations of uh, people with extreme diverse uh, narratives or opinions, perceptions, perspectives to coming together. So there is a middle ground that people are always talking to. Um, so ideally, uh, this is the highlight, is to focus on their youth, because uh, they are often silenced and spoken for. Um, so I would like to create contexts or research contexts that exist for youth to counter the narratives established by media, politics, and, histor and, the, and our historical collective narratives in order to self-define. And art educators have a special uh, kind of position in, in the landscape of culture as a gatekeeper. So they are able to encourage or discourage um, the, the culture that is shared, the language through tradition, folklore, oral traditions, and encourage how we identify ourselves, the stories that we tell ourselves, why we tell these stories to ourselves. And as art educators, we have a unique opportunity to build awareness and pierce these veils of silence, especially when it comes to our youth. Um, I just wanted to mention Northern Ireland because that's, I'm also looking at it comparatively, what, what other countries have been um, struggling and have had to deal with issues of divided people um, within the same land. So um, in Israel, they have the, a divided education system. I mean, Arabs will have a certain uh, curriculum and Sigal will be able to talk more about this, but um, that we have in Israel, you have the language barriers, ethnic, religious, cultural, sociopolitical, contradictory historical narratives and collective memories. And in Northern Ireland, what they developed, which they found um, to help, is these integrated schools of Christians and Protestant children together. They don't have a language barrier, um, but they do have religious, cultural, contradictory historical narratives and collective memories that, that, do, that do contradict each other. However, the language, I come back to this as a major issue um, in education and equitable education in a land where people um, should coexist or can or may. Anyway, so here this is the, um, the workshop that they were doing. So all the children throw the ball of yarn and then one will say their name and then they'll throw it to another. They put it down on the work. And what is the most... Um, Important thing here is that is the sitting together, that basic act of creating, thinking, and thinking together. Um, this is an Arab educator who is with at the Israel Museum ed, with a group of Arab children. And what I wanted to mention is um, how the museum, I was blown away by how, by how used it is. It is full with children and schools. Arab, Israelis, doesn't matter, it is used. There are eight amazing facilities of studios that are used all the time for teaching, for working. It's a very lived and alive, thriving museum um, that I, I would like to highlight in my research to, to show that when we engage youth in cultural conversations, how enriching they can be. Um, for instance, Daniel Landau's um, exhibition, which was there that the children, the youth come, they walk through the exhibition with an art educator and then they respond to these and make works surrounding these as catalysts for um, deeper conversations or just some great art. Um, so Le Daniel Landau, this exhibition um, in 2018 is a living room that's split in two, a very, very stereotypical, um, for instance, Arab living room and an Israeli one. And you would put on these virtual reality goggles to enter into one of these living rooms and have access um, to a living room or a, that, that you would never have or very few of us would have access to. So creating a conversation around this artwork. Um, in here is um, the Arab participant who um, Daniel Landau filmed and you would listen to his stories and through these goggles. So for the children, I think this is really really amazing for the youth because not only um, paintings are wonderful, um, but using this virtual reality was very engaging. And from when I spoke to, um, to the participants, it, uh, 
it created a lot of conversation. Um, part of my work that I would like to add in my research and is digital transmission. So to develop more online accessible bilingual art education, artworks and workshops that connect Israeli and Arab youth together that can cross boundaries because so often um, safety is an issue and how can we co-create without this physical, um, being able to override these physical boundaries. Um, and the, the programming is designed by Israeli and Arab educators and youth, and that it is free um, for uh, economic equity and is not, doesn't exist um, in Israel. So um, youth learning, youth participatory led research, because youth learning within critical pedagogy inquire about what they are learning, what is omitted, is it true, encouraged to see situations from multiple perspectives, and it also values youth as being experts of their lived experiences and their own lives. Um, we more often seem to speak for and override um, or not see or value uh, youth as truly being experts of their communities and witnesses. Um, so, and also our youth needs context in which to process the worlds that they live in to play inside them, to question them, to get messy and be heard. Uh, sorry. Okay, so what? So obviously art does not create peace. Um, it is not an antidote to violence. However, it does create a space for processing, questioning, and perhaps connection, um, and holding spaces that are contradictory, uh, that are not linear. And our youth are the future. They are the most often spoken for. And in, in sustaining, collab, um, co-creating or sustaining any kind of community, it really, we need to create spaces where we sit together. And I go back to that because um, if we rely on only our external sources uh, to tell us how to feel, then we're very limited in our experiences. Um, the programs that exist are nonetheless overshadowed by the negative image that Israel has in the media. Therefore, my research is also about dispelling these myths and building two case studies to demonstrate these innovative and enduring efforts towards encouraging coexistence. And ultimately, peace education is also very difficult to measure due to the nature of conflict and the complexity of the reality. Um, and really going back to, we all have different ideas of what peace is and what it should look like. So in spite of our difficult heritage, um, I think we have a lot to learn from these amazing programs that exist in Israel and how they can even offer and shed some light on how to integrate our First Nations into schools here and create culturally equitable um, education for our students. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, thank you, uh, thanks to both of you. Uh, for keeping so diligently to the time frame agreed upon and for delivering these fascinating presentations. Uh, we are truly just so proud of the work that uh, you've been doing and uh, we are so happy to support, to have been able to support your work here at the Institute. Um, now we have some time, uh, somewhat less than 20 minutes uh, for the audience to ask you questions. So what I would ask is that those of you uh, who would like to put any question to either Natasha or Talor, please, um, well, it's a small group, so I don't think we need to go to the chat. I think if you raise your hand, we can unmute you. And here I'm uh, uh, pulling a fast one on Jennifer because this is not what we agreed upon, but I think we can manage. I we just need to see them if they want to be heard. Yeah, so uh, if anybody wants to raise a hand with the emoji emoji, or if you want to actually just raise your hand, just give us an indication. If not, yeah, Sigal, is that a, or no? Okay, Sigar, please. Um, I think you're unmuted, so please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, uh, so first I, I want to say that I'm so excited to see you all, that I, miss, I missed you a lot. And uh, I want to share with you, it's not, it's not a question, but, but a comment on, uh, on Taro's uh, uh, paper and also the Natasha. First of all, uh, I, I will relate to art education. Uh, and I would say that COVID-19 had made a huge difference 
in the things that you brought up because of Zoom, because of this virtual reality that uh, we are all living in, uh, the same uh, way I can speak to you now, and it never occurred to us before, uh, it became much more democratic in Israel. And many, many, it, it's not the children, it's not the students, but the, the teachers of art education, the, the Arab teachers are uh, now uh, together in groups with the Arab, with the Jewish uh, teachers, both in uh, conferences, Zoom conferences, and uh, WhatsApp groups, huge WhatsApp groups of 200 teachers together, and they have they are uh, sharing an equal voice, and, and suddenly they 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 became very active. I mean, the the Arab teachers. They became very active. They, they uh, speak up. They say, uh, we want this, we want that. We want more, te- more um, uh, lessons to be translated or even uh, written with a cultural uh, tendency to the Arab culture. And, uh, and now it's, it's an historical moment because for the first time after 10 years that I've been the national superintendent of our education in Israel, that now I have a, a one member of my crew, which is a, an Arab a, a crew member. Okay, so she is doing a, a wonderful job a, gathering all the Arab teachers from all over Israel and uh, voicing their uh, questions, their uh, needs. And we are now beginning to change many, many things in the curricula in this regard. So it's a big change. And regarding Tal, Tal disappeared here. Yeah. Is she, Talo, Talo? Uh, yeah, she's, she's, she's there. She's there. Oh, here, here you are. Uh, I just want to say that um, regarding to all your many questions uh, about the uh, Israeli, a uh, question uh, quote uh, Israeli or non Israeli uh, photography. I think um, you should look for uh, the uh, last 20 years because the huge change that occurred, and many, many uh, very, very good uh, artists are now dealing with photography. Just to name a few examples, we have uh, Adines that you probably know and the Ari Barak, and, um, and many others that are uh, uh, doing a very unique job and very, uh, I think, Israeli work uh, in, a, in, a, in the way that we try to define what is to be an Israeli. So thank you both. Sorry for my... Thank you, Sigal. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, contribution. Uh, any other questions or any reactions? From Natasha or Talor, would you like to respond or engage or, or any questions from the floor? I don't see anybody. Yes, Dr. Lauren, please. Hi there. Um, I think my uh, internet is a little bit unstable, so you might be hearing me with an echo voice. But I just want to say how much I appreciate uh, seeing all of you. Um, and uh, especially um, the speakers. Um, I learned a lot from both presentations and I was uh, really impressed that they were well organized. Um, They offered many, many questions and many issues uh, that they are pursuing. And Natasha, I just wanted to say that um, it's too bad you're not doing your whole dissertation on Israel rather than doing this comparative analysis. But I know when it comes to doctoral research that you're expected to compare and contrast. And um, so that's in fact uh, what you um, are doing. Um, I'll ask a Talor question first and then Natasha. Uh, Talor, um, and we've known each other since your first days at Concordia. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, the comparison of the photojournalism and photography as works as, as art, because certainly um, in, in the many years after Israel's, Israel's foundation, uh, photography has been used as um, a form of uh, 
I guess, propaganda. I remember when um, I was in Adath, Israel, in Montreal, and um, I saw all the photographs of um, young Israelis. My objective was to get married and to an Israeli. It didn't happen. I married a rabbi, and we go frequently to Israel. But <laughs> just as an anecdote, but please tell me a little bit of what you can say about this distinctive separation between uh, these two, I guess, some um, uh, forms of, um, of visualization. Um, so thanks, Lauren, for your question. It's so fun to see you. <laughs> um, I think that in my mind, the, I the separation. I, mess, I mentioned marriage teller because you should be married <laughs> very soon. Very soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next week, hopefully. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> Mazel tov, tell it, that, yeah. Wow. Um, so I think there's a slippage between photography as photojournalism and photography as art. And part of that, in my mind, is created through um, the kind of embrace, the large embrace of um, Beaumont Newhall's historical approach to um, historical writing on the medium of photography, which very much took a modernist approach on the subject matter. And so that meant that photographs were really... I've lost you. I think we've lost Talor. Yeah, um, maybe we can try to message her uh, or send her. I'll take care of it. Yeah, maybe okay. Natasha and I'll. Um, hmm. yeah. Can anybody hear, hear her? No. I don't think so. I, I think we lost her for, uh, for the time being. I'm telling her she froze, but if you, I yeah. think. Yeah, and now the image is gone. I'll let her back uh, in when she recomes. Okay, Thank, thanks, Jennifer. No, no, no. And, and my question, yeah, what I'll do is I'll are. ask, a, okay, fine. So what I'll do is I'll ask a, Natasha a question Please. until we can get back to Talor. And uh, Nisa, Natasha, what you're doing is very, very difficult and very uh, uh, courageous. Um, and um, I think it's so interesting that um, Seagal has been telling us about um, much more um, shared viewing and listening experiences. I know that I was um, extremely upset. I get upset by what happens in Israel and all of us do, um, especially those of us with a more liberal bent. But um, I got upset when um, Arab was uh, eliminated as a second language in Israel. And uh, I can relate that to our experience here where rather than eliminating French, so many of our children um, across Canada are studying uh, in French immersion schools. So it's really important to know language, to know uh, the other. Um, what I want to ask you is, I know that you're looking at children, but um, have you also looked at, will you also perhaps in subsequent research be looking at what is happening at Hebrew University where um, one um, artist colleague, friend of mine said that um, there should be so many more uh, Palestinian art students there. Do you have any knowledge of the youth uh, art education at, um, at Bitzalel Academy? Um, that's a really good question. I, I don't have information on that. Um, I wrote it down and you're right, Israel would be like what you said earlier, would be plenty to focus on. Um, uh, when I was looking at Ireland, it was just more like what countries and how have they used the arts in order to enable young voices. But um, I'm also very interested in pre-surface teacher training. Like how do we equip our teachers to, um, it's not necessarily just the youth, also for ethical reasons and it's, but how to create contexts for them. So the pre-surface teacher training is very interesting as well. Um, I know Siga would have like, oh, she's like a wealth of knowledge um, in that respect. Um, but I don't, I actually haven't thought about uh, Betzalel in terms of at that level. Um, I'm also very interested in when we make the extracurricular 
and the special schools as a more standard approach. Um, so it's very exciting to hear that the positive um, fallout of, of this uh, COVID is this more of a democratic platform for communication um, where more voices can be heard and, and speak. And in a way, it's somehow less threatening as well for people sometimes in being face to face. Um, so there's a lot of positives I think we can garner from this. Um, but I will look at, you know, different levels of education, but I, I'm worried about just diluting certain aspects of my research because it's, it's so vast. Education is so vast. And so I have to, but I will think about that, but that's a good point. It's a good point. And of course, there's not a, you know, there's not equal representation um, for, for many, for many reasons. Um, but I see it changing. And Natasha, Natasha yeah. isn't, isn't a big problem that, um, and it's not only for the children, but it's for the youth, it's for the adults, that they dare not speak. But, um, you know, for example, what's happening now, there's such terror and conflict in so many Arab countries. And um, I understand that in the latest uh, statistical analysis, about 60% of the Arab Israelis say, we want to stay here. So, um, but they said that privately. So isn't there a, a danger if uh, in any way uh, these young people speak through works of art that differentiates uh, from the narrative uh, that they have possibly been taught and the narrative in which they've been inculcated? And I know this is a very simplistic point of view and I see Sagal uh, looking quizzically, so I'd love to hear from her too. <laughs> I'd love to hear from Sigal as well, and and this is a major issue. Um, and as I said, that they're what the the people that do participate in these programs are, they're not they're not the extremist. They are people. They're talking to people that are open to this already. Um, but then again, the uh, the Arabs the, that come to these programs are often, from when I spoke to the educators there. In, in, uh, are at risk when they go back home, that they could be seen. If let's say if a, co a conflict erupts, then it's like, how dare you go back to the Israeli side and let your children speak and get educated? It's not like a one, it's a very complicated situation. And so any measure, I think, of trust um, is huge when we look at the reality of the situation and not to have this like, you know, fantasy of, um, and of course, I think there are risks. And but I would say also, um, even amongst the Israeli population, if you go into outside the left and you go and if you just speak freely, um, you don't have the life or the death threats. I mean, this is this is a very different form of violence, perhaps. But um, these are baby steps uh, in very complicated situations. You're absolutely right. For example. Um, if you're um, an ultra-Orthodox woman and you dare to speak out against your community, um, you could be completely ostracized forever. Or know? if I speak to somebody in the settlements and I say, I'm sorry, I, I don't agree, um, we, we will knock heads, you know, and, um, and that's, that's okay. I'd, it's to create spaces for that to happen. So even if these are safe spaces, perhaps to begin with for some um, young Arab youth to talk. And there's not a lot of talking though. That's what I want to get back to. You're constantly working through a translator. You're not able to co -commute, to co communicate, which is, you know, a basic, a basic. And it's, uh, it's happening in all areas. I think back to when, everywhere. Um, like I, I did my high school in Israel. And, sorry. Mm -hmm. I think back to the Association of Israeli Studies that took place in Montreal and Richard Decklebaum, who's worked with um, with Arab, with Palestinian doctors over over at least um, a period of 40 years. And, and um, initially they were able to publish their research together. And now um, any research findings that he's made in helping um, young children um, have better nutrition so that their minds develop properly in Ramallah and elsewhere, um, he cannot publish with, uh, with the Palestinian doctors with whom he has Many, many friends. No, many barriers. Many, many barriers. Just in the interest of time, if you permit me, let me just defer back to Talor so she could complete her answer. And then we do have to wrap up, unfortunately. And I don't say it to cut short this very interesting and very important conversation. But, but I do have to run to another Zoom meeting. That's really the truth of it. So uh, Talor, please uh, complete the answer uh, that you so graciously started. 
Well, not sure where it cut off, <laughs> but I'll just say uh, for the sake of time that it's, it's a complicated issue, not just in terms of assessing Israeli photojournalism, but in terms of assess, like assessing all of photojournalism, um, especially because now photojournalism can be found in museum collections. Like the National Gallery just had a big exhibition of photojournalistic work. So it's like, what, what does that mean when you see it within an art context? Um, and certainly that work also would have an impact on artists as part of a visual lexicon, right? So I'm not entirely sure how to detangle that. I just think that it's part of the, the slippage or part of what makes it a complicated question. I just want to Thank quickly you. recognize a Noah Ogilvy. Noah, you're not showing your face. <laughs> But uh, Noah did a remarkable series, a photographic series um, uh, that, uh, is it still on display at the Israeli Institute? Uh, and when we are there, but of course it is, but we are all, we, nobody is actually it's on, on our campus. website. It's on the website, yeah, it's ah, been very digitalized. Good. Yeah. And so now it's as, as a photographic artist and um, with an incredibly uh, astute um, understanding of, of Israel, um, uh, it would be interesting to hear at some point her point of view as well. Noah, that's not to put you on the spot. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, thank, many thanks to all of you, uh, especially to the two speakers, Natasha and Talor, for uh, bringing such pride to our um, scholarship program and to the great research, to the great research that you've been doing. Uh, before I say goodbye to everyone, let me just uh, refer to the slides that Jennifer started sharing about some of the important upcoming events we have. We will be running a three-part uh, Israeli documentary film series uh, in, uh, throughout the month of October and November. The first film will, that we will be showing takes place on October 13th at two o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, which will be still, I think, 9 p.m. Israeli time. It's uh, a recent documentary, Mabarot, about the transit camps, a very difficult, um, a very uh, controversial, therefore important moment in Israeli political and social history. And the screening of the film, which is free of charge, um, we are happy to bring it to you, uh, will be followed by a, a conversation with the filmmaker Arik Bernstein. And uh, please stay tuned. We have two other uh, documentaries coming up uh, in October and November, one of them about Golda Meir and the last one will be about Menachem Begin, War and Peace. And of course, um, uh, please also uh, watch the slide coming up uh, just about now, uh, about a talk by Dr. Simeon Ehrlich, uh, one of our colleagues at the Department of Classics, Linguistics and Modern Languages on October 19th. It will also be- 29th, 29th. Uh, 19th, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, October 29th. So please stay tuned, uh, come back again uh, to join uh, to, to join us at one of our upcoming events. Uh, we always love to, uh, to hear from you and uh, just uh, spend time together with our common passion, which is Israel Studies. Uh, I wish you a wonderful rest of the week. Moadim Lesimcha to those of you who are celebrating the remaining days of Sukkot, Shmini Atzeret, Simchat Torah. And, um, and above all, stay healthy and stay well. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much.